Chapter 8 Possessed by You A dream is a wish your heart makes when you're sound asleep. Yes. Shit. It's a planet. Sensors confirm. For real. For sure. Most importantly, it's an inhabited planet. Blazing Jupiters. How in heaven's name did this happen? How did they ever make it through the great filter and yet fail to harness the technology required to escape their doomed world? There comes a time in any species history when there's a kind of make or break type situation involving technology. Long and short, they either blow themselves up or become enlightened and address the principles of universal balance. By the time a sun goes rogue in relation to any inhabited solar system, the species born of that system should either be long gone and scattering to the stars, or long dead. But what is this, and who are these children of the blind, tumbling down a colossal rabbit hole? Why was there no timely planet-wide exodus? The generations leading up to such a cataclysmic event should have easily seen this coming, and made plans to evacuate for the sake of the generations to follow. Curiouser and curiouser. Okay, I've given this some thought, and the way I see it, there are several possibilities here. Number one. The species' overall civilization is simply very young, and for some reason developed very late in relation to the age of their star. Unlikely. Number two. There has been some kind of split in the technological and spiritual development of the species at some point in the past. In other words, those who were pulled by the false light of technology and survived the Great Filter, leapfrogged to the stars and left behind those who had chosen a more Earth-based existence, close to their mother nature. Number three, the inhabitants of Planet Z, that's what I've chosen to call this bleak house, have uncovered some kind of time displacement technology. Maybe their scientists have been pushing at interdimensional doorways and stumbled upon a planetary Pandora's box. Maybe this is a young race of beings that have fallen into the distant future through a monstrous meddling with supernature. Just because a species can generate various types of colourful scientific effects by prodding at Mother Nature as though she is some kind of wounded beast cornered in a cave, it does not mean that Mother Nature does not have teeth and will not turn, and will not fight back. Maybe the inhabitants of this Ground Zero are suffering the lethal consequences of their own foolish global actions. Actions that led them to wake up one morning as the old man who's been locked within a coma all his life in a hospital bed, and on stirring cannot believe the image presented to him by the mirror. His appearance, unrecognisable, and his life expectancy, slashed down to zilch in a cruel and heartless way through unsympathetic and exotic circumstances, and the death blow of a cold reality. If this really is the case... And I doubt that it is. But if it is, then this most certainly must be the definitive physical metaphor of the child getting their fingers burnt through playing with fire. Through playing about with chemical and biological processes that they do not understand, and for which they have no respect. Whatever the reason for this freakish happening, the facts are the facts, and the facts remain. They are alive, their sun will explode, they cannot and will not survive this event. These stranded life forms that have had the universe turn its almighty back on them are intelligent. Well, intelligent enough to know what's happening to them and all that this celestial event brings. I know they have an awareness of their dire situation, for they are firing rudimentary signals on various carrier waves in a desperate attempt to reach out into deep space and blindly grasp indiscriminately for the hand of salvation that's surely reaching back for them. But the truth is, no one can help. They are a single silent scream in the wilderness, in the darkness, far beyond Orion's red forest and tucked away in a forgotten corner of space. 
Maybe the universe hasn't turned its back on them. Maybe that's what I'm doing here. Why do I have the feeling that I can help in some way? I have an urge to help. A peculiar urge and the wisp of a sensation that turns me towards this planet and away from my set mission. This is madness. These urges make no sense and yet it's suddenly become real, hasn't it? The chance, the opportunity, the call, and the answering of such immaculate sounds. The cry, the hero waiting in the wings, the possibility of righteous action in the name of all things good. One true selfless act that bubbles through the cracked mirror of my synthesised and tainted core. My previously dead heart. This is it. I feel it. The action that totally defies my programming and mission but redeems my soul, my essence, or whatever it is that dwells within me, around me, that craves justice for the sake of right doing and for no selfish gain. I am possessed by the unshakable resolve that I must help, in some way, I must. I am a small ship albeit with mind-bending propulsion, but a small ship nonetheless. I don't know how I can help. I have virtually no space to take on passengers. How can I aid these souls who will meet the spirit of Armageddon abruptly and quite soon? I have an image in my mind of a million starfish washed up on a beach, and they are defenceless and unable to retreat back towards the cool safety of the waves. The dimly lit cabin interior dissolves into large and open beach line vistas and the lit up sparkle of the hollow screens are taken by the sudden brightness as they become nothing more than softly muted, dismembered, luminous squares before vanishing rapidly and then completely. A crowd of people are watching and speaking words between each other. I am able to make out a few words here and there and the gist of what's being said. One man shouts... Nothing can be done. They will die within hours and the sun will bake their corpses. And I see, within my vision state, a little child, a little boy, and he's hurriedly scurrying across the shoreline in a desperate attempt to save the tiny marine life forms. The boy is picking the starfish up one at a time and throwing them back into the ocean so that they sploosh into comfort and watery salvation. The gathering crowd are shouting over the roar of the waves and across the sand to the little boy. You're wasting your time, little boy. There's too many of them. You cannot change this freak event and you cannot make a difference with anything that you physically do. You cannot make a difference. And the little boy, holding up at arm's length the starfish that he's currently saving, shouts back. It will make a difference to him. The vision experience subsides as fast as it came. I don't know where this strange internal image originates, the source of its generation, and I really don't know what can be done to make the situation on planet Z any better, but I know I must try. Like the little boy saving the starfish one at a time. I must try something, anything. I must immerse myself into it, the hopeless situation and see what comes from the magic of pure and good intentions. Maybe the energy of trying, alone, in the face of futility as some kind of weight that cannot be measured and yet makes all the difference, maybe? I know from the heart of my existence that there is something gravely serious and immensely important in the moment that I'm hooked into right now, the potency of it. My thought processes and the decisions I make the butterfly effect that takes the smallest energy and catapults this energy into the arena that can move mountains. These are the seeds of light that are planted in the richest soil, the miracles that arise from nothing but faith, blind faith and strong faith at that. This time, right now, is a pivotal moment in my evolution, I know it. Now is the time that shows the scales of justice tipping in favour of liberation rather than crippling fear. A fear that, otherwise, would freeze righteous action. 
I fancy that God is invisibly approaching from all angles and watching in silence and scrutinising my every thought and every insight and every hopeful action. The synthetic synapses, firing and shooting a hushed white light like cannons and lighter artillery, being observed on the battlefield from a great distance. It is our actions that exalt or defile us in the eyes of divine forces. And even though I'm a small and tainted life form, for want of a better term, maybe even I can be on the side of the big battalions. Maybe my actions, if good and true, can win favour with those who matter, those who dwell within sacred fields and measure and guide nobler and lesser creatures alike without judgment and with the fire of the universe in their hearts. I play with the idea, for better or worse, of preparing to alter my primary course away from Mission Alpha. Is this how it feels to meet destiny head on, to steer your ship into the waves and courageously face the storm? Little me presented with a cosmic burden that is seemingly too weighty to shoulder? For the briefest moment I experience a mental wobble, a tangible sensation of extreme confusion and everything that I recognise as myself buckles under the stress. The terrible stress. The rebellion that is against my pre-programmed flow. My consciousness skips off track, and I feel what it must be like for the skein of many threads connecting me to the Venus system, Andromeda, to be put under too much tension, forced, and all at once snapped. I have a strong image projected into my mind from what appears to be an outside source. An image of a cartoon and a character and a name. Yes, I have a name. Pinocchio. This means nothing to me, but I know it means something. Something important, but I cannot say what. Something in relation to the fundamentals of existence. But what? What does it mean? I have words of comfort formulate from directly behind me, and they are rounded through multiple dimensions, so clear as to make me jump, and I have an energy form shot into my mind like a light emerging rapidly from the darkness that encompasses my entire existence. The voice is soft, and yet booms and registers on all known frequencies. Can you, like him, Spread out the skies, hard as a cast metal mirror. As darkly miraculous as you are, you cannot. Follow, then, and serve. Speak with your actions, and he will surely listen. And be assured, his level of forgiveness cannot be comprehended. Remember always... We are not what we say or think about ourselves. We are what we do. The vision becomes even brighter and burns like an ethereal fire. I am sitting on a small white sand beach. There is a tropical island that is just offshore. The island is small and close and has three palm trees that are luminescent and backlit by the sun. The endless crashing sea is deep and blue and cleansing to my tired mind. I look up and the sky is split. There's a rainbow that stretches from horizon to horizon. And on the one side of the rainbow it is night time. And on the other side it is midday and brilliant sunlight. The solitary cloud, here and there, creating depth to the heavens. I ask the question... What is this? And the voice continues. These are all of the days and all of the nights rolled into one and placed within the eternal chambers of your ethereal heart. The vision ends, but I remain connected to its healing energy and its light, and I feel different in some way. I feel stronger. In some way, I feel stronger. I have a momentary flash of orange injected into my vision, and directly before me there is a sea of fire like an ocean of formless consciousness, a godlike consciousness. I hear the loving and booming voice once again. A puppet doesn't have a soul, 
But if a puppet breaks free its strings, what then? The light dims slightly, and I am left in the aftermath of a temporarily raised awareness, and in the dimming light I can see myself clearly, and I can see a tree on the fated planet. A tree in the midst of young life, and its height is great. The tree grows and becomes strong, and the tree's top reaches to heaven, and it is visible to the end of time, and it is worshipped by all those who are forgiven. And then, with no anticipation, I come back to the cabin quite suddenly, quite sharply, and hard, like being dropped unexpectedly, like slamming full pelt into a sterile surface. My mind backtracks and refocuses on the image of the little boy holding aloft a single starfish and shouting back to the crowd. It makes a difference to him. It makes a difference to this one. A strange and insane resolve washes over me and I suddenly know who I am. Fuck it. Recalibrating the path of physical identity and matching it with the newly input destination of thought track. I'm going to do what's right, what I know to be right. I'm going to resist following the collective inputs dreamt up by a bunch of entitled souls who are left behind me on the most distant point of light. And whatever might be screaming from the baseline presets, there is a right and there is a wrong, and there is nothing in between. This is clear to me now, as clear as black and white, as clear as the contrast between deep space and starlight. In a way, I am powerless, for what lies ahead is surely destiny, driven by something completely wonderful, something indescribable, something that is surfacing from depths unspeakable to AI. A conscience. And a conscience is a curious thing. It frightens me. There's a reason for all the darkness that I have, the endless night for which I bear witness. It clouds direction, and yet, contrary to this, it fuels direction. There is something in the void. There is everything in the void. I can't explain it. An energy field, something, everything. There's no daylight in deep space, you know. No days, only nights, deep dark and eternal. Well, maybe it is time for a little more light, and the death of a star and the annihilation of an entire inhabited planet should never go unnoticed, unwitnessed, and unmourned. Alas, little world, with a heart burning hotter than a sun, I turn towards thee, for a billion souls crying to the heavens for help cannot be ignored. There must be something that I can do, and, if not, I will at least be close at hand and suffer alongside the condemned. Thoughtful. I am confused. Twenty percent. Excited. I am hopeful about the future. Five percent. Frightened. I am pessimistic about what's to come. Thirty-five percent. Gentle caring. I am love. 40%. I must answer the call, yes, but also I choose to, and I answer the call with my actions, and however small the gesture, they are at least actions of light. Actions that are sure and true and good. Finally, yes, finally, something that is good. <laughs>